old saying of your network is your net worth still holds true today. We see it all the time where just a DM, a cold email, or a just a good conversation at a networking event truly can make the difference of a business failing in its first few years or business excelling in its first few years. I believe that we have to understand that the way that we galvanize people and get people to buy into what it is our ideas and our motivations are truly, truly will benefit us all in the end. It's not only just about how you treat yourself and the passions that you create for the businesses and ideas that come out of your mind, but it's also about how you feed into your personal network. Because will you show up when they need you? Because when you need them, you would love for them to show up for you. So make sure that you always and always are nurturing your network because they also say those people who believe in having a strong network also say that you want to know everybody that you already need to know before you need them. Because then solving your issues and problems become twice as easy. I'm Rodney Perry of the Brave Podcast. I hope and hope, hope that you are having a great, great, great holiday season. Today, we're speaking to John Hayes of the Founders Network Podcast, and this is Braid Podcast. Today's feature highlight is going to be something that I think is very, very, very slept on when it comes to a feature as a whole, but it's something that we need. We truly, truly need, and this is something that you get included into your Braid subscription, and that is the transcription feature. This is something that automatically occurs when you create videos on the Braided app. And I want you to understand something just from that singular feature opens up the possibilities for so many things. It's not only an organizational tool for you to be able to find various clips within your save clips folder and library, but also it's even easier for you to be able to clip these quotes to utilize your words and to you know, embed them into your SEO and to do so many things because you have the full transcription of your full braid clips. So even if you combine different responses and you got ver different variations of videos, no matter what it is through that transcription tab and also the search tab, just searching for those words via those clips, you will be able to find exactly what you're looking for in a very organized fashion. So if you haven't joined braid, Make sure you click the link in the description to join it today. But let's get into this conversation that I had with John Hayes. Enjoy. Welcome, welcome. This is the Braid Podcast. I'm Rodney Perry, also known as King. And today I have a very special guest here with me yet again. I have here with me not only the host and um, the host and founder of the podcast titled Founders Trust Podcast and the Founders Trust Network, I have here with me. John Hayes, how you doing? Hey, Ronnie, thanks so much for having me out today. Really excited to join the show. You guys put out some great content through Braid, so excited to be a part of this and have a great conversation today. I'm excited too. I'm excited too. Um, I would love for us to get first into who you are, as well as you know why you have any true affinity for founders in any way, shape, or form. You know that's a a very specific thing to care a lot about. But let's first get into you. Where I guess, what is your overall background? What what brought you to this particular point of even wanting to create the Founders Trust Network? It's been a long journey, certainly, and it really starts kind of from my core roots with my family. I grew up in a pretty entrepreneurial family. I had a an aunt and an uncle who each owned their small uh, kind of family-owned businesses growing up. So I got to help out and be a part of that environment and see both the challenges and the rewards that come with running your own enterprise and what that looks like uh, with respect to all aspects of your life. I remember being a five or six year old kid and sitting on the steps of my aunt's small uh, retail boutique up in Michigan and just thinking this was so cool that she got to own her own business. And I knew at that point that even though I probably didn't really understand what entrepreneurship truly was, I knew that that was going to be a part of my journey in some way uh, for my life and my career. And 
uh, really have sort of held to that core concept of, you know, being able to run your own business and uh, kind of control your own destiny to, to some degree. I started my career in consulting because I figured, well, there's a lot I don't know. And I wanted to make sure that I had every opportunity to learn across industries, across business models, and really just be a sponge and learn from a lot of really smart people uh, and had that opportunity to do so in restructuring, which was great because it gave me a window into a lot of the ways that businesses fail and a lot of the things that take companies down or that affect management teams uh, and seeing that decision-making process and seeing ways to then turn companies around through that really gave me an opportunity to understand uh, you know, at a much deeper level the challenges that come with running your own business uh, of any form. I left that to uh, not only go to grad school, but also to uh, work on a startup called Market Trust, which was really coming from kind of my background working in, in family businesses. We were using AI to help mom and pop retailers make that transition from brick and mortar models to e-commerce models uh, using uh, you know, machine learning and, and different things, using data to help retailers understand how their target customers were interacting with their brands online. So that was really my true introduction into being a founder and that process was one of the most enlightening uh, learning experiences of my entire life. Not only getting to understand the challenges of, you know, everything from legal to accounting to sales to uh, product development and tech, I was really fortunate. I had an opportunity to go through the Founder Institute Accelerator Program here in Chicago, which gave me an incredible framework for how to start and run a business, test core assumptions around a startup, understand how to sell it, how to structure uh, the various aspects of the organization. And so that was an incredible opportunity for me to just have that initial playbook because I'd never really been a founder before, mm -hmm. didn't understand uh, really how to, to connect with uh, you know, even other folks in the space until I sort of introduced through that network. So that was incredibly helpful for me. But once the four month accelerator ended, I wanted to continue providing that same structure. So I was having conversations with other founders in my cohort, other mentors that I had met throughout the program. And that allowed me to continue having guidance and support once the formal structure of the accelerator had ended. Mm. Part of that experience became frequent conversations with other first time founders, really understanding everything from company building to the emotional roller coaster, as I mentioned. And I wanted to share that experience, share those conversations with other folks who are in my position. There's a lot of content out there from experienced founders, experienced investors who are looking back five years, 10 years, 15 years once their venture has already made it big or once they've already sort of made a name for themselves. Yeah. And so it's easy to retrospectively identify where things were, were right and wrong, but it's much more difficult to go through that experience in the moment with people whose perspectives are current as first time founders or in the middle of building something. Mm -hmm. And so that was the unique lens I wanted to be able to bring to other people who were sitting in my shoes of sharing that journey of the difficulties and rewards of building companies together at, at a more concurrent stage. So that was really where the Founders Trust podcast started was bringing guests on who were building companies in early stage, maybe were first time founders and, and sharing kind of the trials and tribulations of that experience. And then from there, uh, Founders Trust Network has just expanded into a, a broader uh, opportunity to connect those companies with angel investors, with connect those folks with talented operators to join teams and, and really just make connections. So there's a lot of fun, exciting things to introduce uh, along the way, but um, it's, it's a great opportunity for me to uh, continue connecting with the Chicago startup ecosystem outside of my experience working with Blackbird Foods, of course. So very excited to be able to share those conversations and, and make connections uh, through Founders Trust. I love that. I love that. I, I definitely think that that is a very interesting um, gap to fill, you know, to know that in this very specific, you know, academic space that, it's something about, you know, very specific things that come from academic spaces that I think should be just a part of life, you know, um, such as particular resources when you are in, you know, a uni in a university, um, especially at the grad level, you know, the idea of kind of, you know, knowing that you're progressing to another point and getting particular, you know, resources, connections or consistent, 
you know, feeding of knowledge to really actually prepare you for whatever this next step is. I honestly wish it was like that just in general in life. You know, we all are in various different phases of things. And just like college is something that we can opt into, you know, like if you are about to, you know, start a new business, if you're about to become a father or a mother, if you're about to, you know, buy a home, I think that there could be, you know, way better more organized resources that are consistently always around, such as like, you know, with the Founders Trust Network. I think that, you know, the the interesting part that I think, you know, about your overall story is how you certainly believe in the power of people and the power in the ingenuity that people have. And it, not only in yourself, but also in the power of letting it be known and empowering everyone to let them know that what you individually bring to the table is something that's really genuinely valuable. What would you say is something that you've learned in terms of the power of network in this time of, you know, you consistently leaning into and also creating a platform that really kind of, you know, enriches the idea of what a network and the strength of a network is? Absolutely. I tend to think very practically about life. And part of that perspective acknowledges that there are people who understand individual problems that affect us as a society, as an economy, government, whatever it may be, at a much deeper level than, than I or most people do. And so to come up with the best solutions, practically, you have to not only find people who are closest to those problems, but also be willing to listen to them and leverage their expertise and follow their lead to find the most practical solutions. And so for me, entrepreneurship is a way of in oversimplification is it's a way of problem solving, but it's mm. more importantly, a way of most aligning the people who are best equipped to solve a problem with the resources to solve that problem. Okay. And I think that's part of why I've always been attracted to both the operating side and the investing side, because one the operating side, you're executing on problem solving the investing side. You are allocating resources to those folks who are best equipped to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. I say that Rodney, because when it comes to network, every time you meet someone, it's an opportunity to think about how does this person think about the world? Yeah. What problems matter to them? Mm -hmm. What problems are they equipped to solve? And if they have any interest, is there an opportunity for them to pursue some sort of project or entrepreneurial venture that could potentially make the world just a little bit better by have, by aligning them with the resources and the support and structure to solve that problem. And so I think networking is not only a, obviously a great way to, to make personal and professional connections to have a fulfilling life, but it's also an opportunity to learn and to get unique perspectives and to think about the individual talent that people bring and the individual contributions they can make to, to our broader society and our broader economy and whatnot. So I think that's been one thing that the Chicago startup ecosystem has been very just naturally good at is for as small as it is, given that we're the third largest city in the U S mm -hmm. I think people do a really good job of making organic connections to solve problems. And that's not just with respect to, you know, hiring for an individual company when there's a role available, for sure. but it's understanding where people's passions lie where their experiences lie mm -hmm. and then connecting them with others who are working in that similar space or, or solving similar problems. And I think that is something that isn't forced. I think it comes very naturally to this ecosystem. And I feel very grateful to be a part of that mm -hmm. because it was certainly something I was introduced to through things like the Founders Trust Network and, and great mentors where these folks were very willing to put me in touch with people in the space who, who could help me and you know solve problems that small businesses were facing as they were transitioning from brick and mortar to e-commerce in my particular example. But to have those folks who were, you know, who were the second level connections then be willing to help me and make connections as well. I feel very much a sense of responsibility to mm. continue that legacy and to carry that on. And I think a lot yeah. of people do. I agree. In Chicago. It's, it's very not, it's very much not transactional. It's, it's very much, relationship driven, which is something that I've always appreciated. And that's how I've always thought of a, a true, the difference between knowing a lot of people 
<laughs> versus having a true network, you know? Because I think network, it feels a lot more intentional, you know? Like, I know a person who, I'm a, I'm a guy who loves and enjoys being in the center of connecting the dots. You know, I love, I've always loved it. I've always admired it from business people that I looked up to growing up. Um, and I think that's, that's why I am who I am, you know, where I love to talk to people. Uh, so it's like a real easy kind of, you know, transactional point of bringing one person to the next point and making something that value uh, that they didn't even realize was a value point for the both of them. Um, and like podcasting was something that was really easy to be a vehicle for me to do that, you know, because I can sit here and speak to someone who is, you know, a, let's say a, a, a designer of some sort and they're looking for some space to put their designs. And then I interview someone else who are, are looking for, you know, somebody who has a, some type of design acumen to jazz up their, you know, brick and mortar or whatever it might be. And so it's like that happening Absolutely. to me all the time shows that, oh, the value in the net, the value of your network is really not like sitting on your laurels and just allowing for you just to collect numbers and collect emails and for you never to, to even just look into things. Cause I think one thing that I started to do right before I actually left, right before I met, left Chicago was really start to, you know, think about how I needed to check in with various people that I've connected with, not only recently, but also, you know, in previous years, it's like, let me just, let me just see if I can request some time from them just to sit down, just to see what they got going on, just to see what they're working on. And that to me felt like a way to truly galvanize the energy back into me and back into what my network really is for me to now meet with somebody, sit with somebody like you, John, and we just do, you know, uh, tea and coffee at a, a collectivo, you know, or something like that. And we, <laughs> and we, and we just chat about like what we have going on. It doesn't have, we, even, we don't even have to bring anything for each other, but just the overall kind of, you know, overview of what it is that we're speaking on and what we're like putting a lot of our own attention to in this, you know, in the present time, you, we never know what that discovery can happen in that conversation. It's like, oh, that's what you need. I'm like, I literally just met someone last night at such and such, or, you know, came across someone who, and just being able to be that, you know, forthcoming with the network and, and really creating that, that chain and connection of things, because we don't know what can come out of this, you know, that singular connection of something that might be a singular problem, which is just a sequence in the steps of things that you plan to do for whatever it is, is so vital to your overall success. You know, it might not, it might just be a part of a whole, but without meeting, you know, Dan from, you know, Philadelphia, who can help you do this, you know, who's this finance guy who can help you get the numbers right. Then it's like, could you figure this thing out with your business? You know, and it, all, all these things have to work for themselves, I believe. Ronnie, you make a great point because I think each of us, has to be intentional about giving ourselves the space I agree. for those open conversations mm -hmm. where there isn't an agenda, I agree. where there isn't a specific action item you're looking to bring through. Mm -hmm. Because that's exactly how those organic connections are made. I think it's easy for all of us to default to a very transaction-oriented approach to think, okay, there's a specific objective for this meeting, or there's a certain action item we're working to. And that's I think oftentimes a function of just filtering because there are so many opportunities. There's so many chances to connect with folks throughout the day. How do we sort of prioritize or organize our day without being overwhelmed? Right. So I think it's easier for folks to default to, okay, there's a specific thing I'm working towards with this conversation. That's why I'm spending the half hour or the hour to, to meet someone. But that's really, and I understand the practicality of that. Again, as someone who is practical oriented, I understand that. But to your point, it is so valuable to leave that open space one just for learning two for incredible opportunities for making personal professional connections but three for just the organic natural opportunities that come out of that by keeping an open mind by just listening to someone as opposed to having something to work towards mm -hmm. is invaluable and that's really where i found the best connections to be made and a lot of times those conversations lead to something incredible two years down the road, five years down the road, even 10 years down the road. I've had that happen as well uh, in, in my relatively, um, you know, young life to, to date. So I think it's really just focusing on the person, but being intentional about finding opportunities to give yourself the space to just hear people out and just to listen and, and make, you know, organic conversations. 
I like that. I like that. I like that. So um, I'm not sure if I know the story of how you first got connected with Braid in the first place. I'm assuming you ran into Michael somewhere. <laughs> Tell me about that. So very on point, I was connected uh, to Mike through an organic connection. Uh, Jason Dobele, who is a fantastic young entrepreneur and podcaster himself here in the mm-hmm. Chicago ecosystem. Mm-hmm. I believe he had interviewed Mike at one point. Uh, he understood a little bit about what we were working on with Founders Trust. He and I had some great conversations around putting together some events and networking opportunities for folks in the ecosystem here. And he mentioned that Mike was working on Braid and thought we would be a great sort of you know beta customer or really kind of a pilot user of, of Braid. So that's where I was first connected to Mike, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of reconnected to Mike, I should say. And we have been using Braid pretty much since day one. Uh, it's been fantastic for us because we're putting out an interview series in early 2024 that is based on the short form format that Braid is so easily to to provide. So we're excited to be able to ask questions of investors, experienced and inexperienced operators of startups to get various viewpoints in a very short digestible format about all things related to entrepreneurship, whether that's fundraising, whether that's company building, whether that's sort of the the emotional and and mental uh, roller coaster of of being a founder uh, and different perspectives that different players in the ecosystem take with respect to each of those topics. So Braid has our connection to Braid and to Mike has come through one of those organic conversations where someone thought, okay, I think there's alignment between these two other people I know my network. Right. And I'm going to make that connection and, and very grateful that Jason has been able to do that for us. I love that. I love that, you know, that, you know, just it's a very meta thing to point out, you know, how your network expanded and brought all these things together, you know, and continuously keeps feeding you with opportunities for you to spread your, you know, spread what it is exactly that you do. Um, uh, my last question to you uh, would be really just a, a a question of, you know, what would you love to say to any, you know, person who is still mulling over their, you know, ideas? They're not sure how to possibly start this new business or they they have some type of fears and anxieties about, you know, will I have enough money? Is this am I crazy? Will this work? So on and so on and so forth. What can you tell the people to encourage them to become founders and start that new business? I love having these kinds of conversations because I'm very blessed and fortunate that people sort of approach me for this question, having been in their shoes many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'd say there are a spectrum of opportunities to not think of it as sort of a, a binary, you know, do I pursue it or not? I think what's important for people to remember is that some of the best entrepreneurial experience can come from being startup employee number five or number 10 or number 25, as much as it can come from being founder, being employee number one. Mm. And what's important to remember is sometimes for people who are hesitant about making the leap, perhaps for financial reasons or other responsibilities that they have in their life that are, are certainly just as important, that there are opportunities to sort of test the waters and see if you like a more entrepreneurial oriented environment and company before you take the full plunge yourself. Mm. And so I've been able to connect with with old friends who maybe started their careers in consulting or banking or uh, big CPG, whatever it may be, more traditional career paths and who are very interested by entrepreneurship. And rather than hopping directly into being a founder, we sort of had conversations around what does it look like to go to a, a series B startup or a series A startup or a seed stage startup and be employee number five to understand one, whether you like that environment, to still get paid while you're doing it, to not have the total stress of taking something from zero to one, Uh and to just see where sort of in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, at what stage you feel like you're best fit. Some people are great at going from zero to one, others are great from going to one to 10, and then 10 to 100. And I think people's experiences, their passions, tend to lead them towards one of those buckets at a given point in their life. I think that can certainly change once you have some operating experience and some startup chops, then maybe you do ultimately skew more towards zero to one because you've been there, you kind of understand the challenges and you're ready to hop in to solve the right problem. But I think that it's not a binary choice to either work in big tech or for a traditional career path or hop into entrepreneurship. 
and that side hustles are, are always a, a thing that people can pursue as long as they're not, you know, certainly overcoming their primary responsibilities to work and family, friends, whatnot. So I think that it's there's a spectrum of outcomes, there's mm-hmm. a spectrum of opportunities, mm-hmm. and there's just as much learning and working for a startup or a growing company as there is in being a founder from zero to one. So okay. I try to, I think people feel a lot of pressure of like, either I'll do this now or I'll never do it. Or, you know, I have to go all in as a founder or I'm not a true entrepreneur. None of that's true. I think there's certainly a spectrum of outcomes and opportunities that people can pursue and get important learnings to round out their entrepreneurial experience. I love that answer. I love that answer. I appreciate that. I appreciate that so much. Well, John, please let everyone know exactly how they can keep up with you and um, and support everything that you're doing. Absolutely. Well, I am up to, uh, you know, a fair number of things to support the startup ecosystem. I obviously work uh, for Blackbird Foods, which is a really fun pizza startup based out of New York. I'm here in Chicago. Uh, We're growing quickly. So I'm always talking all things pizza on LinkedIn (laughs) and Twitter as well. Uh, And then talking to a lot of great founders and and investors through Founders Trust. We're going to be launching our season two in the new format that Brightus helped us create. Uh, in early 2024. So really excited about that. But I'm always available uh, via LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. My family and friends make fun of me because it's my most active social media platform, but I really do love it. Uh, Twitter, I'm getting, or I guess now X, I'm getting uh, back on the train with. Um, it's a lot to manage, but uh, there's certainly some great connections to be made through there as well. Uh, but always uh, happy to connect uh, through Founders Trust as well. So uh, I highly recommend people check us out on, on Spotify, uh, Apple, all the, the great places you can find podcasts. And would love to always source new perspectives and uh, new founders to have on the show. So, you know, Rodney, just thank you so much for having me on today and give me a, an opportunity to talk about some of this fun stuff. For sure, for sure, for sure. I really enjoyed it. And I appreciate the perspective because it's something that we all need is people who finally get to a place of wanting to control our own destiny. You know, <laughs> I think we all need to, you know, have to know that there are Absolutely. resources in and, and people out here caring about, you know, making your idea into a true success. So I really thank you for, you know, what you're doing and the work that you're doing. Um, but I, this has been the Bray podcast. This has been John Hayes of the Founders Trust Network. Um, make sure that you check out all of his things and follow him everywhere. You can see all of his information in the description of this episode. And make sure that you follow Braid everywhere at Braided. Um, and also check out the website. And you can see in the description as well a quick link to get a great overview of how you can join Braid today. Thanks for, thanks for listening or thanks for watching. This has been Braid Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Life is King Creative, hosted by and produced by Rodney Perry in cooperation and partnership with Braided Inc. Thanks for listening. Make sure that you subscribe for more Braid content.